Hello everyone and welcome to today's The Scientist webinar. I'm Nathan Nee, Associate Science Editor for The Scientist, and I will be moderating our discussion today. Today, our speakers, Dr. Richard Webby and Dr. Edward Hutchinson, will discuss influenza viruses, the development of new strains, how they mediate virulence, and their threat to human society. We like our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and our speakers will address these during the Q&A session that follows the presentations. To ask a question, simply click on the Q&A tab and type your query into the question box located on the right side of your screen. At this time, I'd also like to thank our webinar sponsors, Sinobiological, Twist Bioscience, and Combinati. Our sponsors have provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we have posted these in our handout section located on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during the webinar. This webinar will be archived on the Scientist website, and we will send you the link via email for the on-demand version within a couple of days. Please note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. With that, let me introduce our first speaker. Over the past 21 years, Richard Webby has been involved in basic and applied research on influenza virus pathogenesis, ecology, and vaccinology with a particular emphasis on the human-animal interface. Webby's, interface, or Webby's research re involves the use of molecular techniques and animal models to understand the basic principles behind interspecies transmission as a means to develop new novel pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical intervention strategies. As the director of the NIAID-funded St. Jude Center of Excellence in Influenza Research and Surveillance and the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Studies on the Ecology of Influenza, Webby heads pandemic preparedness efforts, including the development of sequencing methodologies, sequencing analyses, and basic virologic evaluations. Dr. Webby, let's just make sure everything is up and running technologically. It looks like everything is set. Dr. Webby, please take it away. Welcome, everybody. So uh, I guess what I'm going to talk about for the next 30 minutes or so is, is sort of very broadly tied around the title here. Um, I will start off by saying I've, uh, I've got about as much chance of predicting zoonotic influenza as I have of standing in for Simone Biles and winning gold at the Olympics. So if we put that out of the picture to start with, and anyone who, who was hoping they would get the prediction, um, you could head away now. Um, but what I want to talk a little bit about is some of the activities that are going on at this interface. Um, and without going into too much necessary details, some of the areas we think are important for for modulating this transmission of viruses between species and how the global community, at least, is, is trying to use this basic research information to set up some prior, prioritization for um, at least the best use of some of the limited preparedness resources that are around. So my actually, my, my favorite quote in terms of looking at zoonotic transmission of influenza came from Dave Morins at a, a conference on that a number of years ago where he described it as it's like looking for a needle in a haystack but when there are countless haystacks and you don't know what the needle looks like which was you know, clearly the inspiration for my title here um, and, and while I think you know this is maybe a glass half empty type view that was um, you know coming close to a decade ago we've we have advanced somewhat in our understanding, but still clearly there's a long way to go. So with, with that in mind that, you know, this is not a simple thing to do, understand zoonotic influenza, I guess the first question is, you know, is it really worth our time and our effort and our resources? And to do that, I think we've really got to look at what the burden is on the human population of seasonal influenza. And this is the data coming out from, from again from WHO estimates, um, which are updated in 2017. Again, their estimates are that, again, depending on season, depending on pre predominant strain, depending on where you are, anywhere from probably about 300 to 650,000 people um, die 
through influenza-related respiratory deaths every year. So clearly a burden at the level of deaths in the community. Um, what is a little bit harder to estimate, even though that's hard to estimate in itself, but is what the true burden of influenza is during a flu season. And by burden, I mean not just those that are necessarily that die from it, not necessarily those that end up in the hospital, not necessarily those that have to go visit a GP. But this bottom part of this pyramid here, so you know, how many people are actually infected with influenza during a, a given flu season? Um, and this is a, a summary of studies that were involved in, um, again, it was initially a US CDC funded study in New Zealand under the Shivers Project, which is still my favorite study acronym ever. Um, really looking at a bunch of different aspects of seasonal influenza in the community from some of the immunology behind it through to vaccine effectiveness. But one of the goals of this was also to try and estimate what the bottom of the pyramid is here and what the percentage of people um, during a flu season likely to get infected. And of course, this will vary from season to season. This is just one season's estimate. But this we generated from you know, essentially enrolling people at the beginning of the flu season, collecting um, bloods, following them during the season uh, and drawing bloods again at the end of the season and looking for any at least serological evidence for exposure to influenza. Um, again, without going into too many of the nitty gritty details here, the bottom line was we found evidence that 30% um, once adjusted for um, age and ethnicity, about 30% of the population had evidence that they had been exposed to influenza at least to a level that um, stimulated immunity, um, which you know of course is a, is a is a huge burden. Of course, of this, um, most uh, the people infected most actually had no symptoms at all, um, so no influenza-like illness. Um, and let's know about so again. I think just highlighting the fact that yes, we get a lot of people. Um, at the top end of the spectrum, but we get a huge amount of people that are infected with influenza each season. And if we're thinking about epidemic uh, influenza, of course, the question is where does that come from? Epidemic influenza comes from pandemic influenza, which of course comes from zoonotic influenza. So if, if we're really serious about controlling epidemic influenza, understanding zoonotic influenza is um, certainly key to that. And if we look at, again, very familiar to many, I'm sure, but look at what viruses we have circulating in the human populations now. We have our influenza B viruses. I'm not going to talk about these guys anymore. Um, certainly they contribute a lot to the deaths and morbidity in the human population every year. But it's, and although we find some evidence that these viruses might infect um, animal, other animal species. It, this is really a human virus uh, maintained within humans and no real role of animals in maintenance of um, this particular the viruses within humans. And, and we now know we have, well, we had until we went into this pandemic at least, two different genetic and antigenic lineages of flu bees circulating. If we look at the influenza A's down the bottom here, and I've got a sort of a, a very basic cheat sheet coming up about these numbers in case nobody's, in some case, some people are not familiar with that. But certainly, so we have the H1N1 pandemic um, of 1918, sort of the granddaddy of them all. And this virus came over from an avian source, potentially through a mammalian intermediate into humans, um, depending on which estimate you like, around about 50 million people died of that virus during the first couple of years it circulated. It circulated for a number of years until it was replaced by the H2N2, 57 um, Asian pandemic uh, spread and circulated on its own for a number of years with the flu bees until it was displaced by the H3N2 viruses in the late 1960s. Uh, the H1N1 came back in the late 1970s and that circulated along with the H3N2s until 2009 when the H1N1 pandemic came along. This one pretty clearly directly from swine um, into humans and when this guy came in, it kicked out this H1N1. So again, our quadrivalent vaccines that we receive now are designed against the pandemic 2009 H1, H3 component and the two influenza B lineages.
So just a, a, again, a, a little bit of background information just so we don't lose anyone from the very, very start. Um, we're going to hear much more about the makeup of this virus and what's inside it from Dr. Hutchison's next. But yeah, for the, for the purposes of my talk, we really have to think about this virus in terms of these surface glycoproteins. So the hemagglutin NRH, neuraminidase N. Um, so these are both the, the target of protective antibodies against this virus, but also our, our, our nomenclature system for it as well. So um, within the combined reservoirs of influenza A, there are 16 or up to 18 different HA subtypes based on serologic comparison and, and, and a huge diversity of vari vari um, variation within each subtype. Uh, neuraminidase, again, the, um, NA or N, again, a, a bunch of different serotypes within that. And if we're referring to a virus throughout here, uh, again, the nomenclature is A, so influenza A, the host species, where it was isolated, uh, laboratory nomenclature or just a random number, year of isolation, and then the subtype. So here in H6N4 simply suggests that this, well, it says that this virus has a hemagglutinin belonging to the 6 subtype and neuraminase N4. Um, and because the virus has these individual genetic elements on individual pieces of RNA, we can get reassortment when two viruses infect the same cell. So we can get um, a lot of mismatching of these HANA combinations. And again, say much more to come on what's inside the flu virus in the next speaker. So I'm just going to go on now really to highlight a little bit what we know about zoonotic influenza or I guess more the ecology of the virus as a whole. What we do know is that it's these guys in the middle. So the aquatic birds of the world, probably primarily um, ducks that harbor really the full antigenic and genetic diversity of influenza viruses. So 16 of those HA subtypes, um, nine of those 11 NA subtypes circulate within this host. Uh, most cases doesn't cause a whole lot of disease. And it's from that reservoir that viruses sporadically spill over into some of these others. And this is by no means a comprehensive list of all of the host of influenza, um, but just sort of a, a splattering of some of the key examples. And so we have from here, it's spill over into more of the terrestrial poultry species or swine. And we think most likely, most of the time, um, transmission to human occurs through some of these intermediate hosts. And if we look at sort of the diversity from a virologic perspective, we mentioned this is where it all belongs, where it all starts. It's only a subset of that diversity that finds its way into some of these other hosts. So if we're talking about swine, it's really only H1 and H3 viruses that have successfully maintained lineages in that host. Um, a little bit of a wider range in some of these hosts here. Um, we see a lot of H9, some uh, H5, sporadic H7 as well. But again, most diversity here, bottlenecks of diversity leading to these other hosts, and it's from those other hosts we think that humans are most at risk. And so as a, a really just an illustration of how much virus is out there, these are studies that um, Rob Webster, who was my mentor here at St. Jude, um, started some almost 50 years ago now, um, going to Delaware Bay in the eastern shoreboard of the U.S to sample shorebirds as they are flying north on their northward migration from South America. They stop over at about May of every year in this Delaware Bay region to feed on the eggs of horseshoe crabs, which um, are also coming ashore and laying their eggs at this time of year. And so it's a ra rather glamorous job, but we send someone up to the beaches uh, of Delaware Bay every May and collect fecal materials from the rocks in these aquatic birds, influenza is more of a, a, a GI infection than a respiratory tract infection, hence the collecting fecal material. And we send them back to the lab. I apologize, I couldn't find an updated version of this, but you know, if we look at the percentage positive in those samples, it ranges from year to year, um, but anywhere typically from, and this has gone back up since 2012, um, but anywhere from five to you know, 30, 35% of those samples collected off the beach are positive um, for influenza virus. And if we think about what these beaches look like here, these horseshoe crabs I talked about, but you know, if we think in a population like this, some 30% of them may have an active influenza infection, you know, that is an enormous amount of virus within these environments. And of course, it's not just this environment. Here's a picture taken from the live poultry markets in Bangladesh. 
similar situation here and you can go into these environments and find a, a high burden of influenza viruses within these environments and, and clearly a lot of interaction between the human host and the potentially infected um, poultry. And similarly, another one here, this is just a, a study we did again a number of years ago, but in the swine sector within the US commercial swine sector. So we we convinced some vet students to go into swine barns once a month over the period of a year, collect samples. Uh, we took them back to the lab and looked to see how many of them had evidence of influenza infection. And if we look at the, the level of the group level here, simply means um, every time we went into a barn, um, we were about had about a one in four chance of finding influenza within that barn. Uh, and over the course of the study, um, very, very few of these farms remain negative for influenza over the course. Most of them had at least one positive detected. But again, thinking about these barns, thinking about how many there are, how many animals are in them, and at any given time you walk into them, about 25% of them have an active influenza infection. Again, evidence that there is a, an enormous burden of these viruses circulating in these animal populations um, with varying degrees of exposure to the human host. So with that in mind, it's, it's perhaps a little bit reassuring and a little bit maybe surprising too that when we look for evidence of zoonotic transmission into the human host, you know, we don't see a lot of it compared to how much virus is circulating at these interfaces. Of course, we have to um, be careful with that type of statement because we're probably missing the vast majority of infections with these zoonotic strains. This is data from um, WHO reports from October 2020 to February 2021, so the last time um, we met as a group to review this information. At that time, um, we can see there was evidence of spillover from poultry into humans in, in Russia with one of these H5N8 viruses, and China, evidence for H5, some of these H9N2s are very, very dominant um, virus in poultry populations globally, and some swine influenza viruses as well. One avian, avian virus infection in humans in Laos, uh, a couple of swine influenza transmission events in Denmark, one in Brazil, and one in Canada and the US. But again, as a whole, and at least of what we detect, um, relatively small numbers. So there is you know, some quite strong modulators of host range between these hosts of influenza. Um, and when we th we think of this picture here, so we end up with epi um, epidemic influenza starts off with zoonotic transmission from one of these hosts into an individual. Um, and then, of course, from most of those stop at this particular individual here. But every now and again, for, for reasons we're still learning, that virus then transmits to another human, to another human, to another human, and has zoonotic infection turns into a pandemic, spreads globally, and eventually, over the course of a couple of years, settles down to more epidemic profile. And it's important to note also that these, the barriers that restrict virus flow from here to here, are probably probably overlapping, but not necessarily exactly the same. That limit of virus going from here to here, and again, that's evidenced by. You know, as I said before, we see many more zoonotic dead end infections than we do evidence of onward transmission from that infected host. And if we think about you know, what, what may be important for this transmission, again, this is just a splattering, a, a small sampling of some of the factors that could be involved. Um, but I, I bring this up now because when we come back at the end here to what we're doing to try and prioritize resources and to prepare this activities, we've got to think about what the factors are that modulate host range. And certainly there's environmental factors. So just the exposure to the infected host. So I showed you that picture of the beach in Delaware Bay with all of those birds. You know, if you wander out into those beaches, those birds fly away. Um, and certainly at that time of year, you can't even get onto those beaches um, for environmental purposes. So the exposure to that host is actually pretty low. Whereas in that um, picture we showed in the, in the Bangladeshi live poultry market, clearly a lot more exposure um, of the of the infected animal to humans. So that has a big impact on probably the diversity and the nature of viruses we see in humans. There are definitely human factors, population immunity. <clears throat> a lot of the viruses that are circulating in swine, I said, were H1 and H3. Those are the same subtypes of virus that we see in humans. And 
the, a lot of these viruses are distant cousins of each other. And so there is quite a bit of immunity in humans to many of these viruses circulating in swine. So probably limiting this transmission around and certainly limiting onward transmission. Uh, good evidence of genetic susceptibility in the human host to some of these viruses. Uh, I would say we're really just scratching the surface of that. And a lot of virologic factors. Um, so again, from the virus having to get in and antagonize the innate response of the host, there are virologic factors that mean that's probably more effective in one host than the other. We have some very specific actions. So the HA protein has to undergo conformational um, change at median by pH to initiate the infection process. Some viruses are activated at different pHs and, and certainly that limits, limits the replication in another host. The big one that I think most of us are familiar with a receptor preference as well. So particularly if you take a, a virus typically from these hosts um, and from these hosts, they all bind to sugars on the host of red cell, but they bind to very different forms of that sugars. Uh, and so that's important as well. But again, just a, a, a small selection of the vast array of factors that are probably at play. So, uh, you know, the next question that I want to talk about now is so we, we have all of these viruses. We know we have this huge amount of diversity in the animal populations. We don't see all of that diversity in humans. So it's probably fair to say that not all of these viruses have the same um, zoonotical pandemic risk. Um, and if we're thinking about what we can do to actually try and do anything, certainly we can do things like make vaccine seeds against some of these um, vaccine virus, uh, some of these avian or swine influenza viruses. Um, this goes on um, continuously with the WHO system. Uh, you can think clinical trials. So certainly the dose, the route, the strain of some of these avian influenza viruses um, and a vaccine behaves very, very differently to some of the mammalian. So certainly we need clinical trials or some of these to understand um, how to administer um, vaccines properly. We need to take some of these viruses into further laboratory evaluation. So we have various in vitro and vivo models to try and evaluate risk. But again, these are limited by the capacity to do them, the infrastructure and the cost. Um, diagnostic development, of course, and, and reagents. But again, we can't do this to all of them. We can only do it with the subs. So how do we actually prioritize our resources? So at least, even if we don't know exactly what we're looking for in this haystack, at least we might be poking our head into the right one. And. Uh, so the WHO uh, has one system they've pulled into place to try and do this um, through their JISRIS program, which is a global influenza surveillance and response system, which is set up, again, primarily to monitor seasonal influenza viruses to make sure that whatever we get jabbed into our arm, every the beginning of every winter has the best match to what we think might be circulating. But this system um, also looks at these zoonotic strains. And one of the things that has developed is this TIPRA, which is a tool for influenza pandemic risk assessment. This is a tool that is based upon, in great part, a US CDC um, tool, IRAC, which essentially to do the same thing, but has different focuses, focus and has um, you know, slight differences in how it's done. So these are the next slides I'm, I'm going to run through here just to, to finish off our, you know, what this tool is about, um, you know, how it's being used to prioritize these viruses to go into some of those activities we just talked about. And you know, this particular slide set was also one that we used to present in the context of the coronavirus outbreak, um, thinking, you know, so we have all of these variants emerging. Um, and it's the same sort of question from the coronavirus field, right? Is, you know, we get all these viruses, which ones do we have to worry about most? Which ones should we go forward with potentially looking at vaccines, potentially looking at escape from immunity? So I think as we go through this, we can think that, yes, this is a tool specifically designed for flu, but I think in the context of where we are, we need to think about, you know, how this can be used for some of these other emerging infectious diseases as well. So the objectives of TIPRA is really, it's a, it's a component of a comprehensive influenza assessment and it's designed for pre-pandemic purposes. So again, before a pandemic takes place, how to prior, prior, prioritize resources um, and to prepare those activities. Uh, I think the other thing 
as you say, what, one of the main outcomes of this is not just this prioritization of strains. And again, it's important every time you'll see anything written about TIPRA, they say this tool is not to predict um, a pandemic. It's just there to help um, look at relative risks and a means to help prioritize. So it's, again, not there to necessarily do that prediction, which of course is what we all want. Um, but one thing that comes out of this is also identify knowledge gaps. So you have to have knowledge, you have to have data that goes into running one of these assessments. Uh, and quite often an outcome of one of these runs is that you find well, we don't have enough information in this area and that can stimulate investigations, um, further research, further surveillance um, to fill in some of those gaps. So the, the way this um, the tool started was by um, sort of an expert defined elements that were again going back to what modulates host range between influenza. Um, so what are those elements that we are considered important from a public health perspective, animal health perspective, virology? So from, you know, human infections, how many, is there evidence for human infection? How many? Uh, when it does come over into humans, what is the disease severity? Because the outcome of this um, CIPRA analysis is you get a likelihood elements and impact. So measuring both what are the, li the relative likelihood of a strain emerging and should it emerge, what is the likely impact it would have on the population. So that's why disease severity, population immunity, how widespread this is in animals, again, comes down to what is the likelihood that that virus is going to come in contact with the susceptible humans, um, the nature uh, and number of animals infected, this receptive binding property, uh, is there any evidence in these animal laboratory models that the viruses have any transmission potential, particularly in ferrets, which is a preferred model for modeling transmission in humans of these viruses. Susceptibilities to antivirals and genomic characteristics. And these all feed into either likelihood or impact, or some of them actually feed into both. And the way the system works is there is a strain that's selected, say, for example, the H5N8, responsible for the, the human infections in Russia. Um, so the, the strain is selected, selected, there is a period where a virus profile is conducted, so literature search is done, collect, collating all the information that's available on that virus or genetically antigenic related viruses. There is global technical experts that are convened, they go through and they score each of those elements that we just talked about. So they give it a, a score in terms of low risk to high risk. They also indicate what their confidence in that score is as well. Then those, those scores are gone, they go back to WHO headquarters where uh, essentially it spits out a mean point estimate score based on all these criteria. I'm not gonna go into the, the how this model actually works because a lot of that's because I don't fully understand it myself so it goes into this black box and what comes out as a score these elements i talked about actually have different weightings so those again this technical experts at the development of this ranked these elements for what we think were the most important elements and so not all of them have the same weighting in the final score and then there's a report generated and typically this whole thing takes about a two month process to go through again important to note again this is a pre-pandemic exercise in the context of a pandemic I think we can question how useful this actually is. And certainly a two month process isn't very useful um, in response to a pandemic. And what we end up with is something like this. And so we have a point estimate. And these are some of the viruses that have been run through this um, TIPRA. As you can imagine, it, you know, it does require inputs of experts from all the different sectors, from human health, from animal health, epidemiology, virology. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, is a, it is a bit of a draw on time and resources from those individuals. So, you know, typically within a given year, it's only a couple of these viruses that get run through. And we end up with something like this. So take, for example, um, this pink virus here at H5N6, uh, this was done in, in first in 2016. It was, and the end result is that you know the likelihood of emergence of this virus in the population is probably lower than some of the others. Um, but there was concern that if it did actually emerge, the impact on the human population would be higher. Uh, and, and so on and so on. Again, I don't think we need to go into the details of this. But clearly, if you were someone who had 
some resources to go into pandemic preparedness in terms of perhaps doing a clinical trial with one of these HA or viruses that, you know, as a human population, we don't have any immunity to, you know, perhaps you might be driven up to the, one of these in the top right hand corner that either had the most likelihood or the most impact. And this is kind of how the tool is used. Uh, as I said, it's important to know that this tool is only as good as the data that we have to go into it. And you know, often that is one of the, the biggest holes and weaknesses in this whole system. So coming up on about half an hour here, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna stop and just with some overall musings here um, on where we are with pandemic preparedness you know, and what we can learn from it. Uh, the first is that funding for pathogen surveillance in animals is very, very fickle, but you know, it certainly in my opinion is central to preparedness activities. Again, everything we have, have an epidemic disease for influenza started its life as something that was in animals. Um, but again, that pathogen surveillance in this population is expensive, it's resource intensive, um, and it, funding for it tends to flow with what's going on in humans. So certainly back in early 2000s when the H5 virus sort of got legs for the first time and spread out of Southeast Asia into other countries, lots of funding went into this, um, that virus certainly caused a lot of zoonotic, zoonotic infections, never turned, certainly has not yet turned pandemic, and so a lot of the funding for that went away as well. So a lot of the pathogen surveillance, a lot of our understanding of what that virus was doing in animals went away with it. We don't fully understand the factors controlling host range. That's, just, that's really an understatement. Uh, I think we've scratched the surface of what's um, important, and we're certainly um, we're getting there, but we have a long, long, long ways to go. So much more research in the lab, in the field needs to be done. I think one of the things that is also hindering this and anyone involved with moving any biological sample around the globe understands this, that movement of viruses and samples between countries is getting far more difficult, far more complicated um, than certainly it used to be. And this is becoming a major impediment, I think, to our preparedness activities, not just for zoonotic influenza, but even for seasonal influenza. Um, international agreements like the Nagoya Protocol, um, and again, we can go into what that means later on, is really hindering the ability to move viruses quickly around the globe. And this is very important because often the place where these viruses, particularly if we're talking zoonotic influenza, where these viruses are causing most problems in animals is not the same place where the laboratory infrastructure is to understand that virus and risk assess it. Uh, and sort of linked to the little bit of here, sustaining these preparedness activities is challenging. You know, I think we do have these short memories um, and I, if I'm looking for a sort of a silver lining to a pandemic from this pandemic is that at least it's reminded everybody of what impact these animal influenza viruses can have on global public health. And certainly I hope we remember that for a long time and, and invest what we really need to in these pre-pandemic activities. And sort of what I referred to a little bit earlier on as well is that you know although the systems I talked about, these risk assessment the global infrastructure, the global laboratory networks really developed for flu. They've also provided a platform for the COVID response from you know, a lot of the same labs doing the testing for influenza and all, all these countries around the world switched to the COVID response. Uh, you know, a lot of the animal model infrastructure that's brought into the COVID response is, was also really developed upon um, flu. Of course, not all of it, but a lot. And so I think we should also you know, contemplate that as we move forward you know, clearly coronaviruses and flu are not the only two zoonotic threats we have. There are many others. Um, some of them you know, have hardly any resources or work going on them at all. And so I think as we build these platforms, we've got to keep in mind that we should build them to be useful for responding to anything. So with that, I sort of want to thank uh, certainly my host institution, St. Jude Children's Research Boston, and ALSAC, it's, it's funding arm for funding a lot of what we do, the, the WHO Just for Us organization of which we're part of, and, and many, many, many valued collaborators around the world. Uh, and also a lot of what we do and we talked about is funded through um, SCS activity. So um, Nathan, I'm gonna stop here and hand it back to you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Hutchinson.
Uh, sorry, Dr. Webby. I'm getting ahead of myself, clearly. As a reminder to our audience, uh, you may ask your questions at any time using the Q&A tab, and our panel will have a chance to address these questions after our next speaker. And our next speaker is Dr. Edward Hutchinson, who is a molecular biologist whose work focuses mainly on influenza viruses. He received his PhD in 2009 from the University of Cambridge, and then worked as a postdoctoral scientist at the University of Oxford before setting up a research group at MRC University of Glasgow Center for Virus Research in 2016. He was named Young Microbiologist of the Year by the Microbiology Society in, in 2007, was awarded the New Researcher Science Communication Award by the Biosciences Federation in 2008, and has held a junior research fellowship at Wor Worcester College, Oxford from 2010 to 2014, and an MRC Career Development Award Fellowship 2016 to 2021. His research group studies variations among influenza virus particles, particularly in their sizes and shapes, and in the types of proteins they contain. And they seek to understand how this diversity combines to shape the course of an influenza infection. Now, Dr. Hutchison had some technical issues earlier today, so we established a workaround. So he will be directing somebody else to manipulate his slides for him. So that's why you may hear him say next or next slide at several points during this presentation. Dr. Hutchinson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much to the scientists for the invitation to speak here today. And uh, thank you very much indeed to Megan in the back room, who's uh, going to move to the next slide every time I say next in this talk. So we'll start with the first of those next. Thank you very much. So seeing as we're doing this online, I thought I should explain uh, where I'm talking to you. Uh, from. So I'm based um, in Scotland, in the northernmost of the countries in the United Kingdom. Uh, next. And I'm here at the MRC University of Glasgow Centre for Virus Research, uh, where my group uh, mainly studies influenza viruses. Uh, now, we just had a fantastic uh, overview of the importance uh, both to human and animal health of influenza viruses um, and the challenges which face us in their control from Richard Webby. And what we're now going to do is to take a, a deeper dive into the specifics of the molecular biology of these viruses. Next. Um, and really to look at how influenza viruses have to cause all of this chaos which we're wreaking across the world with a very, very small amount of information. One of the really beautiful results um, of the application of information theory to biology is this one. It's the, the observation that there's an upper limit of genome size set by mutation rate. Uh, next. And the upshot of that is that uh, organisms with a low mutation rate, like uh, ourselves, can have very large genomes, whereas um, RNA viruses, which have high mutation rates, have extremely constrained uh, genome sizes. Next. So what you can see here is the complete genome um, of an influenza virus. Uh, so printed out, it's just a, a single page's worth um, of information. And that's all the information the virus has to encode uh, everything it needs uh, to take over the cell and turn it into a factory for making more viruses. Next. And so you can see here um, a, an overview of V-viral proteins. Um, I should say most of these were actually only discovered relatively recently. Um, the, our understanding of what, this, what the virus can do to pack information to its genome has grown uh, along with technologies um, over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and what you can see in this figure um, is that as well as encoding genes um, in the, the standard way of the genome, the virus has multiple strategies to pack extra information in. And these are uh, fairly well understood ways in which uh, information can be doubled up in the genome. So splicing, frame shifting and other similar methods. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some recent work which we and many collaborators have done uh, to identify a new way in which uh, influenza virus is able to pack even more information to this extremely constrained genome. Uh, however, this uh, comes with a bit of a health warnings of talk, which is that as with, I think, probably the majority of scientific presentations, the narrative which I'm going to spin you here about uh, how this study was done is completely falsified um, and straightens out a very chaotic series of studies into something which will hopefully be a compelling argument. So before I dive into um, that scientific argument, and I, I will stress that the, the facts themselves are true, even if the narrative is uh, 
um, reordered for convenience. I would like to tell you a bit about how this study came together. Um, we have published this work, so you, you can read that, but uh, it, perhaps this talk is a good opportunity to tell you about some of the lessons we learned along the way. Uh, so if you'll indulge me for a second, I'll, I will begin with that next. So this work started really quite a long time ago when I was a postdoc at the University of Oxford working for Irvin Foda. Uh, there, and whilst, frankly, doing supposed to be doing something else, I discovered a rather odd uh, observation by mass spectrometry, which I will come back to uh, midway through the talk. Um, <clears throat> and it's a testament to Irvin's generosity that uh, when I wanted to set up a group for myself, rather than uh, continuing to work on this himself, he encouraged me to take this and a number of other projects and use them to uh, um, to be the first projects I worked on when I set up an independent group, which I did next uh, at the uh, MRC CVR. And there I recruited Liz Sloan, a very talented molecular biologist, um, who was the principal person in my group working this project. Uh, she took maternity leave at the end, uh, and we hired Leah Mayer, who is um, also extremely um, good and did a lot of good work on this. this. But we're a small group, and this, as you will see, becomes a very complicated project. So we were able to uh, bring in uh, a lot of collaborators to help us with with this uh, next. I'm afraid we're quite a lot of transitions in this slide. Uh, so locally bioinformaticians and bioinvirologists next. Um, uh, immunologists in the wide University of Glasgow uh, next. And next again and other collaborators who are able to help us um, with um, pathogenesis um, and genomics um, and bioinformatics studies. So we brought together a group of um, colleagues and friends who were willing to share their different, different approaches and different data to tackle this problem in different ways. And it was all going terribly well. And then one day I was contacted by a collaborator who said she'd heard a talk um, on what sounded like a very similar project to ours. And apparently the group had just uh, submitted a publication, had I seen their preprint and I hadn't. Next. Um, and it was this preprint here uh, from Ivan Marazzi and his colleagues, which uh, completely independently of us had hit upon essentially the same story. And it turns out that however um, nicely you've been trained as a scientist, nothing really prepares you for this moment. So uh, we were all a bit shaken by this. We did what you would do, of course, which is we, having almost finished our study, wrote it up as quickly as we could and submitted it. Uh, to another journal, we went to PLOS Biology, and I mentioned them by name partly because they were great to work with, but also because they have a really useful policy where they don't consider priority uh, for the first six months uh, when considering publications, and this is hugely helpful. And we wrote up our own preprint next. And in that, I did two things which I was a bit hesitant about, um, but which turned out to be really important. The first was that I explicitly cited the other preprint in our study and discussed it, and particularly um, then, this has changed a bit in recent years, preprints were very much a grey literature and people would read them, but I wasn't really sure about citing it. The other thing I did was my group had just got me on social media. Next. Uh, thank you. So um, I mentioned that we'd put out our preprint and discussed the other study in it as well. And two things happened. Firstly was that the reviewers seemed to like our study. They asked for revisions, but they next. Uh, particularly like the fact that we'd brought in uh, the other preprint in, into our discussion. And the other thing that happened is that because we'd mentioned this on social media, word got back to the lead author of the other study, Ivan Ratzi from uh, the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, who rang me up next. And Ivan had a proposition. He said that he was fed up with competing with people um, for getting their first and publications. We both had studies which we're getting the same thing in slightly non-identical ways. They both have their own strengths and we could bring them together um, and produce something which would overall be stronger and everybody would win. Uh, all, all the authors would still ret retain uh, their, their credit for the work, which is a, an extremely generous thing for him to do. So we brought together our two studies, my collaboration and next, Ivan's equally large <laughs> attempt to solve this particular problem. And we ended up bringing together a, a paper which had, a, I think, about 53 co-authors on the end. Next, uh, which was published uh, by Cell uh, earlier this year. Um, so I wanted to tell you this story for a, a few reasons, really. Firstly, uh, it really emphasised for me the value of two things, which I think have been have gained increasing attention over the last year, but have also seen a bit of controversy. That's the use of social media and science and also the use of preprints. But for us, both of these proved to be enormously positive things. 
secondly, next, this allows me to acknowledge uh, a few people whose generosity really underpinned the story I'm about to tell you. Uh, Irvin, uh, who really launched me into doing this in the first place and allowed me to take it with me. Ivan, uh, who extended the offer of bringing it together. I'd also next like to acknowledge Ivan's uh, lead postdoc, uh, Jess Ho, uh, mainly because uh, she prepared a lot of, well, she did a lot of great work on this, but she also prepared a lot of the figures for the final paper, which I'll be showing you in a second. And the final reason I wanted to start by telling you the story this way uh, is that if I now next put on our funders, um, this is the acknowledgement slide for the talk, and I can now start again and tell you um, what will hopefully be a, a reordered and um, plausible narrative of uh, what's going on uh, inside the virus next. So starting again, next. Uh, as you will probably be aware, um, eukaryotic genes are coded so that they have a region upstream of the gene itself which is not translated. So the ribosome starts scanning along the mRNA um, and it's only when it gets to a start codon uh, that it starts translating a protein next. It's recently become clear that a large proportion of mammalian genes actually have low efficiency start codons within this so-called upstream untranslated region. Um, and the translations which come from these can have a number of effects. Uh, they can produce additional gene products which can overlap or um, fuse with the canonical gene product. And some of those, particularly those very close to the cap, are upregulated during cellular stress. So what's the relevance of this to viruses next? Well, viruses are molecular parasites, um, and the one thing all of them have in common is that they um, parasitize the biosynthetic machinery of the cell. They need to provide the ribosome to something that will be recognized as mRNA next. Different viruses do this in different ways, but for the, negative, the segmented negative strand RNA viruses, um, a large and diverse group, uh, which includes the influenza viruses um, and other important viruses such as Lassa virus and uh, the very diverse bunny viruses group. Next. Uh, this is done through a process called cap snatching. And cap snatching works like this. Um, you have your host mRNA, which has a characteristic um, starting se sequence, uh, the so-called five prime cap. This is bound by the viral polymerase. Next. Uh, which cleaves off um, the, cap, the beginning part of this, of this mRNA, so both the cap and then a number of uh, nucleotides following that. This uh, cleaved um, RNA sequence is then used as a primer to extend transcription of a viral genome. Next. So the result, next. Next, please, thank you, is an mRNA, next, thank you, uh, which is a fusion of a sequence derived from a host um, mRNA followed uh, by the viral um, untranslated region and finally the viral gene. This has two um, well-recognized effects. The first of which is that it allows viral mRNA to be recognized as mRNA by the cell. And the second of which is that uh, it shuts off the ability of the host cell to uh, translate most of its own proteins. But because a region is cleaved off a host uh, mRNAs, which is large enough to plausibly contain start codons, this um, for us posed a question next, which was this, could cap snatching, this well-recognized process, lead to the acquisition of upstream start sites, start sites? In other words, could cap snatching lead to start snatching? Next. For this to happen, uh, a number of criteria would have to be met. Next. Firstly, we'd have to ask, are there upstream AUGs, uh, upstream start codons, in the cap snatch leader sequence? Next. We then have to ask, do ribosomes initiate on them? Next. If so, do they hit upstream stop codons and then stop translating? Next. If not, are there open reading frames they could access? Next. And if they can access open reading frames, can the encoded polypeptides be detected? Next. And finally, if so, does any of this really matter? Next. So firstly, are there um, upstream AUGs? Well, this was assessed um, and as a number of places in the study uh, independently in two different ways um, by deep sequencing um, the cap snatch sequences derived from the host, which are quite diverse. Um, I won't go into detail on the methods here, but essentially they vary in length, but they all have a a median length of around 11 
uh, nucleotides in length. Next. And when we look at this, we find that consistently the cap snatch sequences uh, contain between five between five and uh, twelve percent of them contain AUGs, which could plausibly function as low efficiency start codons. Next. That's all very well, but do the ribosomes actually initiate on them? Next. Next. So to look at this, we used a method um, called ribosomal footprinting. Uh, we uh, took the cell, uh, we um, chemically fixed ribosomes to the mRNA, digested away all the mRNA which the ribosomes weren't sitting on, and then sequenced the, the RNA sequences where the ribosomes were positioned. Next. And what we find with viral genes is basically this. You have a lot of ribosomes sat on the canonical start codon. Next. But if we zoom into the region upstream of that, you can see there's also a cluster of ribosomes sat upstream of this in the region derived from the host. Two technical points there. Firstly, this has been treated with a drug called harringtonine, uh, which stabilizes initiating ribosomes and lets ones which are already elongating run off. So we are seeing the ones sat on the start site here. And secondly, uh, this is really a technical point. This is so close to the start site, we're assuming that if there's an AUG underneath the ribosome, it is sat on it. Uh, next. And we can look at all segments of the genome. We can see that the ratio of ribosomes sat in these upstream sites to those on the canonical start is consistently 5-10%, to 10%, quite consistent actually with what we'd expect from the transcriptomics. Next. So ribosomes do seem to initiate there. And our next question, next, um, was do they hit upstream stock codons? And if not, could they access interesting open reading frames? Next. So this could be assessed um, by looking at the um, sequences encoded by the viral genome. Next. And two things of interest can happen. The first you can see here uh, in segment five of influenza A virus, uh, you can see here the canonical start codon in green. Um, and if you start reading upstream and read through, if you do that in frame one, next, you read through uh, from an upstream AUG, next, and end up with a fusion with a canonical protein. Whereas if you try it in either of the other two reading frames, next, you hit a stop codon and you get a protein, a, an oligopeptide, which is far too short to do anything interesting. Um, alternatively, if we look here at PB1, uh, so segment two of the viral genome, next. Here, um, starting in frame with the viral gene um, doesn't uh, produce a fusion due to the presence of the stop codon, next. However, if you start out of frame with a viral gene, you can read straight through the upstream untranslated region and continue to read over the viral gene um, in a frame shifted open reading frame. Next. So these are upstream frame shifted, frame shifted open reading frames or UFOs. We, they're also termed Frankenstein orphs in the paper. Next. If you want an example of what both of these are doing, the end terminal extension is rather like the prologue at the start of a piece of text, uh, whereas this overprinting with a frame shift is much more like a palimpsest. Uh, in other words, the um, practice when you had very limited resources to write on of just writing straight over the text which you already had. Next. And how far you can go? Well, it turns out that in um, uh, six of the, uh, sorry, uh, five of the eight influenza A gene products, um, there was a possible end terminal extension of a gene. And in four of them, um, there was the possibility to have an overprinted um, open reading frame, which is more than 30 amino acids in length, in other words, large enough to function as a small protein. Next. So are there orphs they can access? Yes. If so, next. Can we detect them? Next. So this is really where we came in, uh, because I was using proteomics to look at purified virions and detected this um, mass spectrum here, uh, which, if you work out what all the peaks mean, gives you this peptide sequence. Next. In fact, we've got a number of peptide sequences matching to this, uh, this sequence of amino acids. And the reason this is interesting, next, is that these map um, to the nuclear protein of a viral gene and also uh, to the upstream untranslated region, which you can see here in grey, and they go right through it far beyond any possible start codons. Uh, because of the way these peptides are produced with triptych cleavage, uh, we know that the protein has been cut after lysine, so after that first K or after arginines after the Rs. 
So they're starting somewhere upstream of this, which really pushes us straight into the cap snatch leader. Next. And if we look in cell lysates, not only do we find more evidence for uh, that end-term extension NP, we also find evidence um, for those overprinted genes derived from segments one and two of the viral genome, those UFO proteins. Next. So those encoded polypeptides can be directly detected by mass spectrometry. But the most important question we have to ask is, next, does any of this matter? After all, translation is quite a noisy process. Next. So there are two reasons why anything might matter when it comes to a virus. One is infection and one is immunity. Um, we can ask, does it matter to the virus itself? So we can look for conservation of those regions. Next. And we can see this is looking here at uh, PB1. Uh, the ability to encode one of these overlapping reading frames is conserved in the majority of isolates. Next. The sequence uh, that's encoded is highly conserved. This is an identity plot. Next. And the likelihood of getting this by chance uh, through rather convoluted mathematical analysis uh, is extremely low. Next. So these sequences are conserved, but it's worth emphasizing that there could be many reasons for this. That RNA is doing many jobs at the same time, uh, and that might just constrain its ability to um, encode a particular sequence. Next. Um, However, if we start mucking around with this sequence, we can see these effects on the virus. So here we have uh, the end terminal extension of MP. Uh, next, we can genetically engineer the virus to insert a stop code on upstream of MP. Next, or we can create an another virus where there's a mutation which doesn't create a stop code on at the same position. Next. And in tissue culture, these viruses behave exactly the same as each other. However, next, if we put them into mice, um, the virus, which no longer has the extension in blue, is attenuated. Next. And there's a sort of natural experiment which suggests that uh, we're onto something real here. Um, you may remember from Richard Webby's talk uh, that there was a 2009 reintroduction of H1N1 influenza viruses. They've been camping out in swine uh, since 1918. Um, and during that time, uh, they'd evolved an additional upstream AUG. This is data from Paul Degard's group, which is still in preprint at the moment. Um, and in their studies, next, if you remove the AUG, it has no effect in tissue culture, but once again in mice, uh, if you remove the AUG, uh, it makes the virus more virulent. So that's the, the same effect that's seen in the other direction. So these upstream NP extensions at low frequency do seem to be important for the virus, although we don't yet know why. Next. We can do a similar experiment with the overlapping PB1 UFO. Next. Uh, either introducing a stop code on to interrupt it. Next. Or a synonymous mutation um, at the same position. Next. Once again, the viruses behave the same in tissue culture. Next. But in mice, this time, uh, the virus uh, which um, lacks the overlapping reading frame is slightly more virulent. Next. Uh, and this can be seen in regulation of gene expression, next, affecting a number of immune regulated processes, next. Um, we don't yet know why, but this suggests to us that uh, these overlapping uh, upstream viral ORFs can modulate virulence, and we're still now working to try and find out why. So we think these things can be important for infection, but what about immunity? Next. Uh, well, if we look at these um, novel viral sequences, we can see they contain a number of plausible epitopes for T cells. We don't think they'd be recognized by antibodies because there's no reason to think they'd be on the surface of the virus or indeed of the cell. But uh, infected cells display peptides chopped from all the proteins inside them on the surface and can be attacked by T cells that recognize those. So they could be recognized that way. Next. To test this, um, and this is just one of a number of experiments, uh, we inserted a very well characterized epitope uh, into the viral genome in such a way that it could only be um, expressed through upstream translation. This is the syn fecal epitope you can see here, uh, also known as over 2. Next. Uh, we infected cells with this engineered virus, fragmented those cells. Next. Um, next. Next. <laughs> and fed those fragments to a dendritic cell, uh, which displayed the peptides next in a way where they could be recognized by T cells. And we used T cells from a genetically engineered mouse, which is exquisitely attenuated to detect this particular epitope. Next. 
And what we found next um, was next again, activation of those T cells. Um, and the things to look at here are uh, mock and wild type virus behaving the same. The peptide itself um, fed in stimulates the T cells. So does a virus which we engineered to put that epitope into a canonical gene, but to an equal extent, so does a virus which has put it in the frame shifted gene. Now, this is a hypersensitive system, but next, we can run the same experiment uh, in uh, normal black six mice. Uh, and here what we do is we infect the mice and at day eight, we label um, endogenous, so circulating T cells, and we just look uh, using tetramers to see if they are responding to either, either the canonical viral protein NP or to ones containing this over tag. Next. Actually response to NP and to this um, tag, which can only be produced by this novel upstream translation method. Next is really very directly comparable, uh, suggesting you could have a, um, a significant immune response there. Next. Uh, so yes, these things can be produced and yes, this does seem to matter. And very briefly, um, next, I'd just like to emphasize that this doesn't just affect influenza viruses. Bioinformatic uh, analyses suggest it should affect essentially all of the uh, negative strand RNA viruses. So they all have gene products we previously unsuspect, previously didn't suspect, which could be produced in this way. Next. Um, and some sequencing carried out on influenza B virus um, shows that it has the same capabilities uh, to encode, to produce mRNAs with upstream AEGs. Next. Um, as the sequencing the extremely unpleasant arena virus, Lassa virus, uh, which has a slightly different gene, genome coding strategy in that it goes both forwards and backwards. But each way it does is it uses um, cap snatching to produce its mRNAs. And in all in each of those cases, it can then produce some novel uh, open reading frames through start snatching. Next. So just to conclude then, start snatching is a general mechanism for upstream translation in cap snatching viruses. Start snatching expands the viral proteome through N-terminally extended viral proteins and through novel overprinted ORFs. Uh, we've now got a great deal to learn about what these cryptic gene products are doing in the biology of a virus. But we do know that in influenza A viruses, start snatching appears to modulate virulence and its products are visible to the adaptive immune response. Um, and so that's a conclusion to the science part of the talk and also just to emphasize um, once again how uh, how nice it was to take part in a process where we could not only collaborate with uh, so many people, but where the use of social media and preprints brought us together. In fact, I since can see that Jake Seymour in the comments has already said that uh, uh, he remembers the tweet going out in the first place. Um, so this was, um, yes, nice to see it reached you beforehand as well, Jake. Uh, so thank you all for your attention. Um, and once again, thank you for your invitation to tell you this story today. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Hutchinson. So we now enter our Q&A session and we do have several questions already submitted. So let's get to them. Uh, for our first question, I will address Dr. Webby. And this is, we've, I think we've had a little bit of discussion uh, about this occurring behind the scenes, but we had a question on the when you investigated the presence of the influ ends of virus in farms, could you talk a little bit more about the nature of the farm types and whether or not things like farming scale, diversity of species on the farm, uh, animal housing circumstances, population density, those things might play a role in your results and also in, uh, in uh, influenza reservoirs forming or zoonotic transmission? Yeah, so certainly, and I'll, I'll start with a, a, apologies if I have to run here. So I'm about 12 stories up and you've picked the exact day someone's decided to power wash the outside of my windows here. So if there's all of a sudden a huge noise, I might have to cut off my mic. Um, but having said that, yeah, so and, and Marie Culhane, who has actually answered that, so Marie was really one of the driving forces behind that study. And, you know, absolutely the presence, that's kind of what we did the study for, the presence of virus um absolutely did was impacted by sort of the type of um type of barn it was and what practices they had within it even even outside of that and something i didn't show but i showed 
you know, the, that picture of the live poultry market in in Bangladesh, you know, where you know, again we've had some longitudinal samples, um, sampling for a number of years. That was a power washer, I guess you guys heard. Um, <laughs> I, lo I logged on from another uh, my laptop here, so if he cranks up again, I'll I'll, I'll move to another room. Um, but actually, so um, but we did another study for a number of years in parts of Western Africa. We went to what we thought were pretty similar environments. So you yeah, you took pictures and you know, lots of poultry present, and we spent a large amount of U.S. federal dollars trying to find influenza in that environment, and we couldn't find a single one. Um, you know, we looked at things, the type of species was the same, but the only thing we could come up with was the fact that um, probably the density, so the density of population was a lot less and some of the upstream marketing chains were different. So, you know, clearly there are things that can be done to modulate that. And I think if you look, if you look even if, actually, I'll stop that and I'll move and we can come back to that if we have to. All right. Well, uh, while Dr. Webby relocates to another another room for our next question, Dr. Hutchinson, do you think that the novel ORFs might be playing a role in the balance between genome transcription and protein translation for the virus? So I'm, I'm slightly in dread that uh, someone's going to start attacking my windows now, but uh, we seem okay for now. Um, it's a great question, actually. Uh, so we. At the moment, we don't have any clear data on this for the virus, but what we do know is that in cellular proteins, this is exactly what happens. So um, ribosomes um, occupying mRNAs uh, impact the rate at which other ribosomes can translate the same mRNA. Um, and so for that reason, yes, upstream um, products really do have impacts on the regulation of their downstream genes. Um, we don't yet know whether that's happening for influenza, but it seems quite plausible that they could be fine tuning the expression of vir viral uh, proteome. So, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, for our next question, I'm curious, and I'm not an expert in uh, in this field at all, but I'm curious: does start start snatching, cap snatching? Does that vary at all? Because it is using the. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it is using elements of the uh, the host cell machinery. So does that vary at all based on infected cell type? So we haven't compared infected cell type systematically. Uh, in the study, there were um, two sets of cells compared. There were human monocyte derived macrophages uh, from our collaborators. Um, and, um, you know, I actually, I now forget what uh, Ivan's uh, consortium uh, used in this. I think they were um, cultured cells on, on their part, uh, cultured lung fibroblasts, I believe. Um, so we were getting broadly similar results in those, but not enough to compare those systematically. Uh, the study which we were drawing on, which was carried out uh, primarily by Sarah Clercy and her colleagues in Kenny Bailey's group um, at the Rosen Institute at the University of Edinburgh, um, they looked over a time course of infection. And because um, we know from cell biology that these upstream start codons are often particularly important in the stress response. We thought, well, we might see really interesting effects here. We might see as the cell is driven into an increasingly stressed antiviral state, we would see a shift um, in the use of upstream uh, um, start codons by the virus, which is a really lovely idea, but as is often the case uh, with lovely ideas, it proves to not be the case. <laughs> they do seem extremely stable um, in their expression levels throughout infection. Um, which makes me suspect that that would probably be the case um, if you started comparing other things at other cell types as well. But actually, we don't have that data at the moment. Thank you very much. Uh, I, th I think we have word that Dr. Webby is back. Um, Dr. Webby, would you like to finish uh, where we left off, or would we? Would you like to move on to another question? Uh, we can do either, but I, I, I just wanted to. I think the most important thing about that question is yeah, clearly if you could understand the factors that drive prevalence you can do something potentially something about it i think the hong kong experience you know, since they really been grappling with avian flu since the late 1990s and you know they went into this environment that was pretty heavily contaminated and 
you know, through surveillance, through basic lab findings, you know, they, they realized that a lot of the diversity coming into their live poultry markets was driven by the ducks that were in there or the wild, particularly the wild duck. So, you know, they separated those birds from the rest of the population and that reduced the amount of diversity they were seeing in the markets. They realized, again, after doing surveillance, that a particular type of one of the viruses, one of the H9N2s, was primarily in quail. So, again, they moved quail to a different marketing system and that, again, reduced diversity in the environments. And then, again... I keep on saying it through surveillance because it's, it is so critical. They were able to show that, you know, they would essentially clean these markets up and then they would gradually see in these markets that um, the burden of the virus would build up over the ensuing days. And so, you know, with that information, the authorities mandated that these markets um, had started off at one rest day a month, then two rest days a month. And again, what they did was essentially reset the starting clock every time. So again, reducing burden. So I think the real real world answer to that question is, yeah, there's there's lots of things that control how much virus is in some of these environments. And in many cases, they can actually manage through simple um, sort of management practices. Not all the case, but certainly in some. Thank you, Dr. Webby. On that note, how much, and of course, it, you know, we, we kind of live in, in this COVID era where testing, testing prevalence, testing positivity, these are now kind of commonplace terminologies that you see on, on the day to, you know, everyday news. In terms of animal, animal-based flu, animal-based influenza, how much screening currently exists? And does that screening prevalence, the frequency, does that differ from animal to animal? And is it tied to how often an animal interacts with humans or is it tied to how how susceptible an animal is to being an influenza reservoir yeah so i I guess the first question um how much goes on and and again it it varies um you know depending on what viruses we're talking about and what animal hosts we're talking about whether they're actually exported um yeah so um, whether there's export requirements for screening some of these um, poultry, for et cetera, moving across countries. Uh, other times, you know, it's more driven by academic um, exercises going to those environments. Um, so it, it kind of does run the, gaunt- run the gauntlet. There isn't a whole lot of it done. We should probably start with that. Um, and, yeah, the the other... So the, the question, again, we... You know, what drives some of those prevalences and and the results of it? You know, in some of these environments, most of this virus is one way traffic. We think so, particularly say from the poultry reservoirs, um, where we have these H nine H five viruses. It does seem to be pretty much one way traffic, where those viruses sporadically infect humans. We haven't seen a lot of evidence that the uh, the viruses flow the other way, i.e. from humans to the poultry. But you know, I guess keeping in mind, we probably don't do as good a job of screening those poultry for those viruses. But if we go to the other environment um, and you look at swine, in that environment, it's a, it's a both ways. So viruses do flow from um, swine into humans, but it's probably even more virus that flows the other way. So it flows from infected humans into swine. And if you look at the diversity of influenza viruses in the swine reservoirs around the world, you know, a great deal of that diversity comes from the human host. So you know, we, we, if you're a if you're a, 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 a swine, and should you be more scared of humans or humans of swine from an influenza perspective? It's probably more valid for the swine to be scared of us. Thank you very much. Uh, doc- Dr. Hutchinson, the, I suppose this is kind of a simple question, but why do you think you didn't see any differences in in vitro behavior, but you saw differences in in vivo behavior when you tested the various genomic alterations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think particularly as molecular biologists, we really like wherever possible to use the simplest possible systems to to study 
infection biology, but this is a case of uh, as simple as possible, but no more than that. Um, so there are two sets of problems um, with using cell cultures to study infection biology processes. And you know, this is not news. Anyone who, who does it is well aware of this. Uh, one is that um, we tend to use cancer cells, uh, which are just growing by themselves um, in weird environments and which have lost most of the genes which regulate their immune response in order to thrive in dishes. Um, so all, they've already lost a lot of the normal things which they would uh, use to fight off viruses. And the other is that they don't exist within the context of a host where you have immune signaling and different cell types moving in and a tissue architecture and all of these things uh, which uh, actually lead to, to pathogenesis. So it's not that uncommon to see um, effects uh, in whole animals which simply do not reduce down to tissue culture levels. You can see really um, gross effects, if you like, things that really trash the cell uh, will be visible regardless of how you look, but these subtler effects, you, you need more subtle models. So it would have been lovely if we'd see, <laughs> seen effects in the simple models, but we weren't particularly surprised that that wasn't the case. It does mean we're still looking to figure out what's going on there. On that note, um, I don't know if you had a chance to investigate it or not, but when you talked about uh, differences in virulence, did you have a chance to look at cellular or molecular indicators of that uh, in terms of maybe immune response or antibody titers or cytokine release or any, any of those factors? Uh, so at the moment, um, we're quite early on in these studies. So the effects we saw with the PB1 UFO mutant were extremely subtle. Uh, so there were two different versions, in fact, of this experiment because we have the two different parallel studies. Um, the version which we were doing in collaboration with Lab of Maria Amarim at the Golbenkian Institute, um, the effect was so subtle that we never quite uh, got a clear picture of it. We could maybe, um, we, we, if we, if we went in with a lot of virus, we just didn't see anything at all. It was only when Ivan Maritz's lab went in with just the right amount of virus to see very subtle effects that they were able to see even the effect we observed and published there. And when they saw that effect, they were then able to use transcriptomics to start looking at what the differences in gene expression were. And sure enough, there were, uh, was differential regulation of the immune pathways taking place. I'd be really cautious at this point to attempt to... Uh, speculate about what's going on there. It could be a number of things. It could just be simply the virus replicating faster or slower and then triggering different responses. It could be a more um, directed interaction with immune response. There's a lot more work to be done there, uh, which we're currently engaged with, but I suspect it'll be some time before we have a clear answer. Thank you very much. Dr. Webby, uh, this is perhaps a bit of a broader question, but can you t offer your co any comments on the dramatic reduction of influenza cases this past year with the ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic and whether or not there will be a rebound as either the world kind of returns to normal or just general distancing and other safety precautions, uh, regulations get relaxed? Yeah, so I can answer neither of those really efficiently, but I'll, I'll, I'll bluff my way through them here. But you know, I think that the first part is clear, right? So when the, the coronavirus started to circulate widely, everything else went away. Um, that wasn't just flu, it was RSV, it was paros, it was adeno. So all of these respiratory viruses went away. I think we can argue back and forth about why that is, and, and people probably there have their own pet theories. I think it's probably a combination of everything, right? So the social distancing, the mask wearing, the lack of international travel, probably some virus virus competition as well, because you know, we we saw this lack of flu activity almost in every country of the, I say almost, because some countries did have some flu activity in almost every country of the world. So it was in countries that did a really good job of social distancing, shutting up tightly, wearing masks. There was a reduction in countries that didn't do that well. There was a reduction in countries that had no SARS-CoV-2 virus circulating. It happened in countries where there's plenty of SARS-CoV-2 viruses circulating. So, you know, I think there isn't one 
sort of responsible element to why it all went away. You know, of course, I've been asked this a lot in the last couple of weeks is, okay, what's going to happen when it comes back? And it's going to come back, right? You know, and maybe we, at least for some of them, if you look down, so I'm a New Zealander, uh, if you look what's happening down in New Zealand right now, they're having a very, very severe RSV outbreak in their kids. And I think you can you know, probably come up with a hypothesis as why that's probably happening. So you know, RSV typically infects kids when they're pretty young, right? And so, but we haven't had that virus circulating well down there probably for a good two seasons. You know, and so now we have a much wider range of susceptible individuals than we would typically have. So, you know, with RSV, I, you know, I think we are, and we're experiencing, I guess, some of that in the US, even during our summertime. Uh, flus, I think, is a little more complicated, right? Because, you know, the the impacts of that are spread throughout much more of the population, which has some immunity anyway. But, you know, if you look at some of the work coming out of the laboratory, um, of Aubrey Gordon up in Michigan, who's got some studies down in Nicaragua, and some really nice epidemiologic studies have been following this cohort for a number of years. They can show, you know, people who are infected in one year can have some form of protection or less likelihood of getting infected with other flus for, you know, following seasons. So, you know, I think it's not out of the realm of possibility that, you know, because we haven't had this priming of our population immunity to flu over the past one, one and a half, two flu seasons that, you know, when this virus does come back, it might have a little bit more legs, a little bit more kick than it typically does. Um, you know, but it wouldn't be the first time I've been wrong. So um, I guess we'll, we'll find out here in due course. But I think, yeah, it's fascinating, clearly. And you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen. And when it comes back, do you anticipate that it would be, I suppose, wildly different strains than what we've had previously or more or less the same yeah i mean that's interesting too and ed may want to comment on that as well because you know, if you look at the h3 and twos right the human h3 and twos before the pandemic there was quite a bit of genetic diversity in the viruses circulating and and there was a little bit of geographic distribution of those so you know in some parts of the world there was some genetic lineages of that virus circulating more widely than others um, but now they've gone into this huge bottleneck, right? So what's going to come out at the other end? Um, I don't think all of that diversity is going to survive. I think some of it's going to get lost. And, you know, so what comes out at the other end may be um, a reduction in diversity for a period of time. And I think we're actually seeing that in the data, at least what's managed to circulate through the bottleneck. When we come out the other side, of course, um, it will start generating diversity again. But again, there might be one of those resets. And so, um, you know, these small silver linings of a pandemic might be that we have slightly less diversity um, that we have to contend with in terms of selecting strains for vaccines. Thank you very much. Dr. Hutchinson, how does cap snatching or start snatching, how does, the, how does it help the virus? And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Why does the virus do it? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, the default answer to that is a really boring one. So the default answer to that is it does it because it needs to use cap snatching to, uh, to produce mRNAs. And by carrying out cap snatching, it inadvertently um, cap captures these start, the start sites. In other words, that this is translational noise, if you like. And there are other examples of translational noise. So Jonathan Udell's group um, at the NIH has done a, a, a great deal on what they call drips, ribosomes, defective ribosomal products, ribosomes just uh, translating bits of a genome which you wouldn't usually think should get translated and these then being picked up by the immune response. There are a couple of reasons why I suspect that might not be the case here, even though we still don't really know quite what's going on. Uh, one is the preliminary evidence that we have that this is indeed playing um, a clear role, uh, not clear role, it is, it is playing some role in um, the progress of infection, um, and it is being maintained despite being visible to the immune response. So both of those are suggestive um, of an effect. Um, and the other is a more speculative argument, really, which is that this gives an opportunity for um, the virus to 
explore evolutionary space. Um, and you have to be quite cautious with these arguments because it is quite easy to uh, go into magical thinking very, very quickly here. Um, but a lot of the additional gene products I showed you at the start of the talk uh, accessory gene products, the virus doesn't need more time, but they all have dedicated expression mechanisms, um, which there would only have been um, an evolutionary advantage to evolve if there was already a gene which, when expressed that way, gave a benefit to the virus. So there's a kind of chicken and egg thing. How do you how do you start expressing a gene which is going to be valuable for you until you have a gene which is valuable enough to want to express? And having something which just randomly fires off at the start of a genome and starts exploring that genetic space could provide a route forward um, into that. And over the rapid evolutionary timescales of RNA viruses, which mutate very quickly, which evolve very quickly, it is plausible that this is allowing the virus to um, start co-opting new regions of its genome. There's some very vague suggestions from where accessory genes start appearing, this may be the case, but we are very much into the realm of hand-waving now. I'm open to the possibility that it's just there because it's there. Um, and even then, if, immune, if it's there because it's there and immune response sees it, it may not be useful to the virus, but in terms of targeting the virus more effectively, it may well prove to be useful to us. Thank you very much, Dr. Hutchinson. We are coming up quite quickly on 4 p.m. Eastern Eastern time over here in the, on the East Coast of North America. So I think we have time for just one more question. And I'd like to address that to Dr. Webby. This might be a bit of a big one, but it's maybe the most, maybe the most important one from a pandemic perspective. For COVID, we've come up with, let's not say one vaccine, we've come up with basically five or six vaccines. And the vaccines have kind of turned into a silver bullet for, you know, finding a way out of the pandemic. Is that possible or feasible with influenza? Right. So the answer theoretically, I guess, is yes. Right. So um, can we do that with the vaccination strategies we have now is maybe temporarily, but longer term no right so we again the strategies we have now target the hemagglutinin and primarily which is the most variable protein and again you can immunize against one type of virus but it won't do anything against the others um so in that regard you know even if we had the say the mrna platforms reduced uh, produce such tremendous antibody responses against flu as they have against the sars cov2 virus then you know, theoretically, if you've got enough people vaccinated, enough people immunized, heck, if you went around and got people to wear masks and social distance for a, a little bit longer, we know that reduced the burden of influenza on its own. So throw vaccination on top of that, then perhaps you could, right? But because of these animal reservoirs, something sometime sooner or later is going to come and backfill that space that was left. And so, you know, this is where the big push for much more broadly reactive, the you know, the, the universal flu antigens comes in. So if you can do those same things and immunize with um, an antigen that provides protection against the whole gamut of diversity of flu viruses, then theoretically it's the case. So we would continue to be exposed. We would continually have animal viruses that keep trying and keep trying. But um, again, if that vaccine's out there, it works, it's immunogenic, then theoretically I think we could. Um, you know, we're clearly nowhere near that yet, um, but it doesn't it doesn't hurt to it doesn't hurt to hope. Thank you very much, Dr. Webby. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. If you have any further questions, please consider reaching out to our speakers directly. Their emails are shown on the screen. As a reminder to our audience, this webinar will be archived on the Scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar becomes available for viewing. I'd like to thank everyone who took the time to join us today, and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I would like to thank very much our speakers, Dr. Richard Webby and Dr. Edward Hutchinson, as well as our sponsors, Sino Biological, Twist Bioscience, and Combinati. Thank you, everyone, and have a pleasant day. <laughs>